I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to The Conversation with Al McFarland. I'm glad to be here and glad to have you along as well. What an amazingly beautiful uh, Halloween season here. Just perfect weather. Uh, I think it's like 50s and 60s and 70s. That's the range. That's kind of really amazing for Minnesota. I remember uh, when we had like a 30, 35 inch snowfall one Halloween. And that kind of is what's etched in my mind as what's possible. At the same time, I remember we've also had some Thanksgivings that were extremely mild and beautiful. So who really knows? But uh, the lesson is enjoy every day. And when the rough weather comes, enjoy that too. Get your ski boots, ski shoes out, your, uh, your um, you call it ice skates, and just get with it. Stay busy. Enjoy because you, you can't change it. You may as well join it. Listen. Today, uh, first of all, thanks uh, to you for listening here on KFEI and those who are connecting with us uh, around the country, around the world through our social media platforms. Thanks to Black Press USA for sharing and streaming our program across their YouTube page and also their Facebook channel. Obviously, we're streaming this on Insight News and McFarland Media, social media platforms as well. What's the point? What's the purpose? Our intent is to connect our people wherever we are and to find ways to bring us into you know, being with each other in conversation, talking about things that matter, uh, presenting our analysis, our version of the truth, of our truth, of reality, and describing things in a way that the narrative that we write is a narrative whose end is that we win. How do we create uh, a future, a plan, a future in which we emerge victorious? And, and in the process, discuss that our sense, our idea of being victorious may not be what other people hold it to be. Uh, we may envision a victory that does not depend on a vanquished or a defeated person or an adversary. We may envision a victory in which everybody everywhere wins all the time. I think that's the name of a show somewhere. I heard it, but it sounds good right now. Listen, uh, first of all, hi to my writing partner, Brenda Lyle Gray. Brenda, how are you doing? I'm fine. How are you? I am well. Good to see you again. And we're 60s here too, so that'll work. <laughs> there, it works. Well, you're, you're in New Mexico in the mountains. I'm right. here in the cities. We, we're going to spread this out a little bit because our first guest is joining us from LA, I think. Wow. Uh, our, our guest is Olufemi Ogundeli. Uh, he's Associate Vice Chancellor of Admissions and Enrollment uh, at the University of California, Berkeley. And uh, in that capacity, he provides vision, strategy, leadership, in the recruitment and evaluation of applicants to uh, uh, the nation's top public university, the University of California, Berkeley. And so his vision and leadership in undergraduate admissions outreach initiatives target California's uh, LGBTQ+. Uh, it's undocumented, it's underserved, it's first generation students who have uh, and his efforts have resulted in uh, three of the most ethnically and geographically diverse classes of students in Berkeley in three decades. He's also been successful at building outreach processes and onboarding experiences that have resulted in greater diversity at Stanford University, Cornell University, and now the University of California, Berkeley. He's created partnerships with national associations and foundations, organizations that search out uh, you know, promising students anywhere from around the country, and especially those from underrepresented backgrounds, bringing them uh, to their higher education experience. In addition to his work uh, domestically with diversity, he's revamped and increased initiatives to uh, students and educators throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, he remains committed to the scholarship of equity in education. He's also currently pursuing his doctoral degree at UC Berkeley's Graduate School in Education. Uh, Brother Femi, may I call you that? Uh, Chancellor, a good afternoon. Welcome to the conversation. 
Thank you so much. It's great to it's great to be here with you both. Let me take a deep breath on all of that. My <laughs> goodness, congratulations. Thank you. Thank Can you. I get your autograph when I meet you one day? Absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Brenda is an educator as well, both at college level and at uh, the high school level, and is also an author. Uh, Femi, Brenda and I go back. Uh, we were in kindergarten together in Kansas City. I haven't seen Brenda in person, I think, probably since around 1960, oh, maybe wow. 62. Or so it's been, a bit, it's been a minute. But uh, you but, would think that we had seen each other. Yeah. I'm heading up there this spring, but not <laughs> the winter. <laughs> not the winter. But we go back, and that's cool because it gives us a perspective. We sort of uh, both bring this idea of what we saw and remember seeing as we entered awareness of the universe at age three, four, five, six years old. And we are both 75. And we can look back on, uh, has the world uh, developed as it should have, as we expected, as we wanted, as we desired? Uh, where have things gone left or right or up or down? Uh, have, have, have we failed? Has humanity failed? And if it has, uh, can we provide a critique that rights the wrong? And as I said at the beginning, begins to insist uh, that we undertake our responsibility to co-author, to co-author, to, to co-write, co-create futures in which we win. So with that, I know all of that resonates with you and your mission as an educator and as a, a chancellor. Uh, let me say welcome to the conversation. Uh, no, take, it, take, take it from there and what's on your mind as we speak, introducing yourself and your work. Well, yeah, it, it, it again, it's a, it's a real pleasure um, to be here with you both and um, I just want to say to to Brenda and, and and all the educators who have been doing this work for for decades, just a huge thank you um, for all of your commitment and 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 recognizing that education is definitely a thankless place, um, but it is it is something that is so necessary for the evolution of our of our people and 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 I think that um, for me in, in in the work that I've done, I've really uh, evoked a lot of what I believe are some of the sentiments from generations before in regards to the urgency of now and the need for us to not wait when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion work. I, I tell people often that there are generations of families and communities that have been waiting for us to make a move. And so I, I, I don't have an interest in waiting another month or another year or another five years um, to be aggressive about our desire uh, to pursue equity and diversity in our work. Um, my time uh, throughout my career has been really interesting because um, it wasn't until I came to uh, to this institution, um, Berkeley, that I'd ever been in an environment that could not consider uh, race or, or gender um, in the evaluation process. In, in every other institution, the private schools or, or back in my, my time when I spent some time at University of Delaware at the public schools, we were able to consider race and gender, which I think are, are really important because they are big pieces of, of, of identities and, and, and all of the research and the data shows how those, those specific points of identity can interact with the education um, uh, structure and, and experience in this country to create different outcomes. And so Berkeley's definitely been a challenge um, for me, uh, but, but I, I will also say that I, I came to Berkeley recognizing um, how important it is to provide access to really strong and excellent public education. And I think that uh, there's no other institution that I, that I can think of um, that I believe was ready for me in regards to um, uh, already me kind of tapping into this ethos around um, inclusion and belonging and justice. Um, that, that's not something that I, that I scream about on an island here. It, is, it really is the narrative that, that, that drives the entire institution. So that's been, that's been really exciting um, for me so far. I'm Al McFarland. This is The Conversation with Al McFarland. My guest is Olufemi Ogundeli. He is the Vice Chancellor of uh, Recruitment. I guess that's the right title, or let me get the right title for you. Uh, the Vice Chancellor of Admissions and Enrollment at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, you know, you mentioned, uh, and I'll call you Femi for short, right? Is that okay? That's fine. Yeah, that's uh, the uh, You mentioned this sense of urgency, the sense of not being able to wait. And I want to unpack that. Does that mean, uh, is, there a, is there a critique in that statement? 
uh, a critique of what we have done, what's been historically the uh, the modus uh, of operation for our community, or or maybe the resistance to our community's forward movement from outside from the social social structure. So so when you say, you know, I don't see the need to wait another day or month or year, mm-hmm. is that in itself a a statement or critique about what has been. I think so. I, I, so, so just just so you know about me, before I stood stood in this role um, at Stanford, at Cornell, at um, University of Delaware, and these other institutions, my main job was doing multicultural recruitment and diversity work. What I have recognized in that space is that no matter the institution, when the time gets tight, the personnel gets low, or the resources become slim diversity is what's always compromised. The commitment and the work around diversity is what's what's compromised. One of the main reasons why I decided to take on this role and to, and to really recognize the need to be a leader in the space is that leaders get to dictate what is prioritized when the time gets tight and, the, and those resources get low. And so I challenged myself and this institution to say, what would it mean to actually center our work around diversity um, and recognizing that this is the goal, the, the mission. It's not, it's not something that's additive or ad hoc but it is truly something that, is, that our, all of our work is, is centered around. And so um, a couple of examples of that would be, for example, um, when you come to Berkeley and you look for our diversity brochure, we don't have one in our mm-hmm. moment because having a diversity brochure means that you go somewhere else to understand the diversity of our institution. Rather, the diversity of our institution is embedded in every piece of literature that you're gonna receive from my institution. It's embedded in our websites. Um, And so recognizing that this is who we are and not just this other thing that we value, I think think it's quite important. Um, and so that's that's been a it's been a shift in in how we do our work. It's also a shift in where we go. Um, uh, one of the things that that I've also noticed just in our in our field this this notion of what does it mean to go and recruit um, recruit and 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 do outreach. I'm a big believer that with an 11 percent acceptance rate, and this is something that I that I, that I carried with me when I was at Stanford as well. And we had about a five, less than a five percent acceptance rate is recognizing that there's not a single audience that we are going to stand in front of where a majority of the students will be admitted. So that means that we have choices and we we show our values through our choices and where we go and why we go there. I do not have an interest necessarily in going back to um, schools or communities that know everything about us and we can see that because of the, just the enormous amount of applications that might be coming from, a, from an area. I'm way more interested in going into places where we are not getting applicants or where we're not getting um, admits and figuring out what can we do there to be able to tap into the talent that exists in those areas. And a lot of that is us going into neighborhoods and, and changing minds and, and demystifying our process. A lot of that is also looking internally um, at ourselves, at our processes, at our staffs, and figuring out what biases do we have around what excellence um, and academic excellence looks like? What biases do we evoke when we're evaluating um, our students? And how do we mitigate those to to make sure that there's um, diverse versions of excellence that can emerge in our evaluation process? What's the um, landscape right now uh, when it comes to uh, the court, its consideration yeah. of affirmative action. This is a critical moment. Tell us what's going on right now. Yeah, so yesterday um, we heard kind of the final arguments um, for, uh, at the Supreme Court level around the students, uh, SFFA, or the Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard College and the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and their use of race in, um, in their evaluation uh, process. And so affirmative action really is on the, on the table um, right now, and we we heard uh, really from a conservative majority um, some some disheartening things around the value of affirmative action, and I, and I'll say this as well: um, I would have never guessed when we saw uh, a ballot uh, or, or or an opportunity on our ballot here in the state of California a couple of years ago um, to. Uh, repeal Prop 209 and restore affirmative action, I, I would not have guessed how, how much that would have failed. And, and that, um, that is something that I'm recognizing that even the conversation around affirmative action has become so distorted um, that, uh, that I think that we have forgotten the whole reason why it exists. And so um, there currently are nine states across the country that have similar Prop 209 or affirmative action um, bans. 
Uh, and, and I think that with what's happening across the country, the question is whether or not that's going to become something that we see um, in a much more broader context. It's been really interesting because I think a lot of folks have been asking me, because we have been doing really great diversity work here at, at Cal. We've done a lot of um, great work making um, our institution much more diverse, much greater representation specifically of our black and brown um, brothers and sisters. But I think that um, it's important for folks to recognize that, and I, and I will say this emphatically, that um, the inability to consider race and gender in, evalu in an evaluation process is particularly harming for students of color, as I think it erases many of their experiences in the classroom, and specifically some of the things that make them dynamic that will not show up on a high school transcript, right? And so, so our inability to, to, to see that and to encourage that and to embrace that in our evaluation process, I think does put us um, at a limitation that right now many other schools do not have. Um, and so, so my hope um, is that the Supreme Court surprises me, but, but I think what, I, what I'm noticing um, and, and kind of the writing that's on the wall is that it's not going to go in that direction. And I think that all of us in higher education and in K through 12 education need to brace and prepare for that. What's the workaround? What do we do? Uh, no matter what the court does, we have an obligation to ourselves, to our people, to both the past and the future to succeed. So how do we work around uh, whatever the uh, current actions, policies created by the court may be, as we hope for the capacity to shift the court in the proper direction in the future, near or far? What do you think? Yeah, so I think the first piece is recognizing, and I talk about this a lot, that just the importance of context and, and recognizing um, how important it is to see students in the experiences and the environments in which they are navigating and what that means in our evaluation um, process. It also means that we need to create fair metrics to evaluate students. The K through 12 experience is not apples to apples all across the country. We know right. that. We know that students that are in more affluent areas have uh, more extracurricular activities. They have um, stronger, stronger um, curriculums in their high school. And so for us in admissions to have um, admissions processes or bars that um, privilege certain experiences and, and, and disadvantage others is incredibly irresponsible. And we need to figure out ways um, to, to make sure that we have a process that's reflective um, of our students. I would also say, and, and this is something that I talk about a lot. So uh, right before the pandemic, we got rid of um, the standardized testing. We, uh, the, the University of California got rid of the use of SATs mm -hmm. or, or ACTs in our evaluation. And while I could go on and on around why that, I, why I think that's a good thing, and, and the importance of recognizing that the SAT ha does have greater correlation to socioeconomic status than student ability once they come onto campuses, I think it's also important to remember that the, the biggest issue around the use of the SAT are us, the people who use them to decide what it means around a student's ability to succeed on our campuses. We have to check ourselves, I think, in the profession. Um, around taking these shortcuts um, to, to evaluate students. I think that evaluating students at a place like this is hard. It's an 11% acceptance rate. Last year, we received over 130,000 applications, and it should be hard. And, and I think that it's, it's, it's something that um, we need to give credence to. And, 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 I, and I only say that about the SAT because the greatest fear that I have is that we replace one imperfect metric with another imperfect metric and put all of our faith and hope into that one, the way in which our profession put a lot of that into standardized testing. And so um, I'm really glad that the conversation, COVID has, has, has made the conversation become again more contextualized. Um, mm -hmm. But in regards to the workaround, Al, to answer your question, mm -hmm. there is no replacement for erasure. There is no, there, there is nothing that you can do that will allow you um, to, to really dig deep and, 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 and bring in the most diverse Candidates than you can as you as you possibly can without being able to understand very you know important aspects of their of their identity and, and the University of California has showed that we've spent millions of dollars over over the last twenty years since we got rid of affirmative action to try our best to um, get more diverse students on our campuses and we have not returned to those pre Prop two hundred nine numbers and it's not from a lack of trying. Right. So, so the impact has been really significant and palpable, right? You're saying yes. that. What are the metrics there? How, how, how deep of a, a an impression 
uh, has the change made on the work? Yeah, so so I, I can say that for for the let me say two things. The first piece is that a lot of times when when we do our work, um, people ask us, um, like go to the places, for example, where you can find dense pockets of black or brown students, right? Go to the high schools and do do the good work in those high schools. But when you peel back the data, for example, in the state of California, there are 55, there are more than 500 high schools that have 50% or more Latinx students in them. There are only 20 high schools out of 6,000 that have 44% or more African-American students, oh. right? The density argument does not work specifically for black students, at least not in this state, right? And so it, it's recognizing that um, we also, the, the, the synonyms don't exist anymore, right? First gen does not equal black. Low income does not equal black. Rural or, 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 or Pell recipients does not equal black, right? And so there are no other proxies that will replace the ability to understand um, an individual's race or ethnicity. Um, now, there are contextual factors that allow us to take a look again at things like geographic location. Um, I think the importance of understanding a student um, in respect to the uh, what they're navigating. And so that's when we talk about excellence versus perfection, as well as um, the ability to recognize a student in the environment that they are coming from and how important that is. Um, but again, that means that we need to make sure that we're being reflective and that we're researched um, in, our, in our work. And then also putting aside um, the privileges, again, that we appreciate in some of our applicant pools um, that, that only privileged people have. Not everyone has the ability to participate in things like Science Olympiad um, or the Intel, uh, or be an Intel finalist or a Siemens finalist. These are amazing opportunities that students get to participate in, um, but not everybody gets access to those. And so what does it mean for us to recognize um, that a student who might not be doing a lot of extracurricular activities because they are taking care of two younger siblings and they're working in their parents' convenience store is, is exuding the same amount of responsibility and leadership and caring and, and community capacity as the, the students who might be doing really great service trips across the country or across, um, or across the world. Right? We have to be able to recognize the excellence within both of those. Um, otherwise, again, we're just doing a disservice and we're ignoring the experiences of, of a growing part of our population. I'm Al McParland. This is The Conversation with Al McParland. My guest is Femi Ogundule, who's University of California, Berkeley, Assistant Vice Chancellor and Director of Undergraduate Admissions. And, uh, you know, Brother Femi, talk about uh, the challenges of leadership. You've mentioned COVID-19, its impact. Uh, but also the other uh, sort of twin occurrence in the past couple of years is the uh, global impact of the murder of George Floyd. George Floyd, one of many atrocities, but one that is uh, more visible than most, one that captured, galvanized the public mind around the world about a systemic failure uh, and a systemic abuse, uh, aggression towards Black people in particular, and one that uh, um, sort of pulled the cover off uh, the process of denial that uh, our, uh, uh, what I call the white supremacy uh, network uh, employed in maintaining, uh, hopefully, well, from their point of view, uh, the charade that, you know, when they disadvantaged one person, it was just that one person, just that one incident, when we know it's systemic. So what, what has all this meant to you individually? George Floyd, COVID, your work, the trend uh, in our nation, perhaps in the world, uh, competing energies with the conservative uh, and uh, sort of self-avowing uh, racialism of white people uh, versus what we've been working for and towards, I believe, and that is a uh, uh, a more perfect society that recognizes the humanity of every uh, person on the planet and that seeks opportunity for all with justice, equity, and fairness. What do you think? Yeah, I think that it was, I mean, it was, it was the easily the, the greatest challenge of my professional and personal life was that, was that, um, the racial reckoning or the George Floyd summer or whatever you want to, 
to call that. For, for, for us, I think it was, um, there was, it was, and this has happened to, as you mentioned, this has happened, you know, there, we can count the, the names um, of folks that have impacted us. And I think what's really, what's really fascinating is the way that um, certain stories might have a, just a disparate impact on us compared to others. And George Floyd and, and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery in particular, the three of those in concession were really um, something that took a, a real big toll on, on myself and, and a lot of my staff. I thought that it was, it's the first time that I ever um, needed to take a step outside of work and go in and, and, and protest in the streets. It was the first time that I had ever really done that, that I had been moved um, to do that. And I, and I realized um, how important it was for me to react before I responded. Um, and so, so once I came back to work and kind of got my, got my bearings um, together, I, I recognized that in my role, especially working at predominantly white institutions, I have to decide if I want to perpetuate or dismantle white supremacy, to your point. And so I, I, I decided to go with the dismantle. And so the, the first things um, that we did was we, we, we took some stances in our social media uh, from, from Cal Admissions and we took some stances um, on, on supporting and, and, and recognizing um, George Floyd, the black community in its time of, in its time of mourning. Um, we, we also, um, we also uh, it was, you know, before it was a national holiday, we had closed our offices for Juneteenth, right? And again, that was an opportunity for us to educate our staff on the experiences of Black Americans um, in this country, but then, uh, then I think I think for me it was around um, calling back to why we do education work in the first place and the common good that education is supposed to be, and and again going back to that urgency um, that yes it's important for me to to not only be in my position but it's important for me to be in my position and speak about the things that are affecting um my community and so um so we did that and and um we we went out to different conferences and you know we talked about it at the chancellor's cabinet and at, at every space in which people would hear us um but i do think that i do think that as we continue through this work it shouldn't be lost on us that there will be another george floyd of another era there will be another um, Trayvon Martin of another era, um, and these young these young people are more um, invested in this uh, than more informed on it and more invested in it than I think that institutions realize or are ready for. And so, holding statements will no longer be enough, right? It, it really is going to be around the investment of the Black experiences, um, and that's why I think it's 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 really important for us to to keep that pressure um, on uh, because again. Um, when the time gets tight and things get low, oftentimes this stuff can get pushed to the side, um, and that to me is unacceptable. And so um, it's it's really been a, a passion of mine to continue to carry this work um, forward. And and while we while we have a lot of other initiatives that we're trying to figure out here um, at at Cal, um, I refuse to allow um, the the black narrative to be silenced or dis or dismissed. I want to want to ask you about your sense of hope for the future, how you see things going and where you see yourself fitting into it. I want to particularly ask you about being a first generation American before the show started. You indicated that your mom and dad are uh, uh, are Nigerian. Uh, I'm, I'm a first generation as well. My father is from Cuba, uh, but my mother's side is multi generations here. But I carry a sense of what it means to be uh, part of an immigrant experience. And I'm curious because of that about the presence of African people, uh, the diaspora in the, in the West and around the world. And uh, I'm curious about how we get to know each other and if knowing each other. Uh, that in a way that technology affords mm -hmm. is part of the difference that will be made. Because we've been having the conversation about American education, the university, but the solution from my point of view is bigger than it goes beyond. And it's mm -hmm. about us connecting and determining if there are other strategies <clears throat> where I, I'm a John Coltrane fan and one of the, the uh, last songs published uh, of his uh, posthumously, posthumously, I think that's the right way to say it, after he died, was uh, both directions at the same time. And I think about what that means. I love the music, but I think about what that means. And somehow it means that not only where we are and where we've been, 
where we want to go and we can't abandon one to do the other or forsake one to do the other, that there's a capacity to be both and to do both and to go left and right or forward and backward. And in effect, it means uh, a new centeredness about, uh, you call it the immediacy, the urgency of now. It empowers uh, the moment, the breath that we take uh, at this time and and using your words again, contextualizes uh, all that has happened before and all that we envision and desire and hope for the future. I'm going to ask you about that. But before that, I want to bring in another guest, uh, Esther Duran. And Esther Duran is uh, joining us to talk about the uh, film festival. Uh, I'll let her describe it, but she uh, is uh, associated with uh, New York and Caracas, I believe. Uh, I'm reading notes from her uh, Vimeo page. It says she's a New York-based film and television producer with an MFA in film from Columbia University and more than 25 years working in the field. She's uh, got extensive experience in the most relevant stages of film and video production, including writing and directing, editing and sound design, production managing and distribution. And her films have been awarded numerous prizes in uh, the U.S. and internationally. They've been broadcast on uh, PBS stations and community stations and Deep Dish TV. Uh, I can read more, uh, but I want to bring her in, let her <laughs> introduce herself and talk about what she's doing. Uh, one thing that we note is that she's curator of the Real Sisters Film Festival. I think that's the name of it. Uh, what is it? Esther, good afternoon. Welcome. Bien, bienvenido a nuestra programa. <laughs> Gracias. Thank you so much. It's an honor. Uh, and on behalf of Real Sisters, um, thank you for inviting us. Uh, that long bio is because of age, nothing else. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yes, I'm here um, um, uh, representing Real Sisters of the Diaspora Film Festival. Uh, it's a festival based in New York City uh, that was founded by African Magazine. Um, and actually, we are celebrating this year our 25th anniversary. Uh, the festival is right now happening um, in person and virtually. And actually, um, to your comment about um, other ways in which we needed to uh, communicate um, or like use um, as uh, ways of resistance uh, um, in addition to education, I was thinking, you know, film mm -hmm. and the image, the power of the image. And, uh, and that's uh, actually a territory that uh, we need to actually um, reclaim, we need to uh, own. And uh, the mission of Real Sisters is that, is uh, it's a festival devoted to um, films made by women of color. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea is to actually uh, give voice to those, um, to those filmmakers and create a space and a platform uh, to support those narrative and uh, in many different ways, uh, not only by showing the films, but also providing uh, workshops, um, uh, trainings, and also fellowships. Uh, we recently um, uh, gave out our first uh, fellowship to three filmmakers uh, through a micro budget film fellowship, mm -hmm. uh, where we gave them $5,000 to help them initiate projects. Um, so that in a nutshell. So uh, your most recent project, my notes say the project is called A Chocolate Conquest, and it's a web-based documentary series that plunges the viewer into the world of cocoa farming as seen through the eyes of three rural communities in Venezuela. It's an interactive series that calls attention uh, of, of Latin American scholars in particular uh, because of its unique use of ethnographic filmmaking for public use online. And the project has been presented in conferences at Princeton and Widener University. Talk about uh, this project. What is it? What's the, the uh, vision and purpose and what are, are the outcomes you're seeking to uh, achieve uh, in this 
uh, communications strategy, this uh, documentary uh, yeah. series? Um, yeah, this is a, a web series. Uh, they're all um, short uh, stories of uh, from ranging from three minutes to eight to ten minutes. And they are all stories uh, recorded um, in the area of cocoa growing in Venezuela, which actually was the first region in the Americas where the cocoa was planted um, the, in, in, in plantations uh, in the 17th century with actually, you know, uh, slave work. So it's actually a very rich um, culturally um, and economically area um, that has been neglected. Uh, Venezuela was actually a cocoa power before it was an oil power. And uh, for a couple of centuries, that was the main means of um, uh, economy. So uh, that area was neglected uh, historically, culturally. So what we did was go back to those um, towns and talk to uh, the farmers and talk to the chocolate makers um, and uh, help uh, promote their stories, help. So we collected about um, 35, 40 stories mm -hmm. and we hosted them in a page that also gives you information about where these um, uh, communities are uh, geographically, um, also with photos and uh, with uh, additional information. But it's basically the story of these communities told by the members of the community. So Very yes, it, it's a it's an ethnographic. We could tell that it, it's uh, it's it, it's very ethnographic um, in that sense, but we didn't want to, we wanted to give the voice to the communities. And in, in fact, I've been criticized because we have a, a whole community tell the story of this town that was thriving 50 years ago. And then we advent of the roads, uh, the whole agriculture um, economy disappeared, but only told through the voices of the members of the community. And I was criticized because uh, they said I wasn't fact checking, um, that I needed to also hear other uh, uh, perspective. And I said, um, I'm not interested in that. You know, mm -hmm. if you visit that town, you talk to those people and that's mm -hmm. the story they tell you. And that's their narrative. And that's what I want to communicate. My intention is no other other people could do those. Mm -hmm. But that was actually my intention to just um, hear the stories of those communities through their own uh, uh, through their own telling. I would call that revolutionary, uh, Esther Duran. There's something uh, special about that uh, persistence and that attitude, that insistence that uh, we must recognize and honor the voices of the people in the community. And, and I raise the question to you and also jump in, Brother Femi, uh, how do we give voice to our people globally differently in ways that uh, create change in ways that create freedom what can we do how how do the things that we do in our professional and art lives move us towards freedom whatever freedom is and i speak as i call myself a an african in the new world a new world african and i say esther that i'm so glad you're doing what you're doing uh, in south america because uh, for North Americans like me, uh, there is a conditioning to not see ourselves, our cousins, our brothers, uh, in the Caribbean even, and certainly not in Venezuela or Colombia or uh, Brazil, mm -hmm. though there are more of us there than there are here. Uh, Amy, you were saying that uh, your dad told you that the largest Ogun society is in Brazil. Uh, yeah. and, and so and then Cuba. And no? then Cuba. Right, right. Of course, of course. So what do we do? How do we how do we understand that your capacity to produce Esther, your capacity to teach and educate Femi, uh, will have an impact and the impact is going to mean global and uh important change uh in, in the world. What do you think? Uh uh, Esther first, and then Olu, if you would, Olu Pimi. Wow, that's like, you know, <laughs> that's intense. Uh, 
but um, uh, here's uh, what has been a lot in my mind um, with this bombardment of media images with the existence of these social, uh, you know, social media. Mm -hmm. And it actually um, it started um, daunting on me during Black Lives Matter <clears throat> because there was so much coverage by phones, right? Like everybody was covering it. Everybody was taking pictures and it was there. And it was amazing because a lot of these people were reporting their own narrative, their own stories. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, the technology is, is very, it, it could be very helpful, you know, in, in basically giving, give us um, or give those communities more empowerment about the, the narrative that we're building. And that would be part of the freedom, I think, right? Freedom mm -hmm. of expression, freedom of us telling us our own stories. But here is a catch. And is that those platforms are owned by very powerful corporations. Mm -hmm. And all that narrative is being hosted there. And it mortifies me that one day, uh, this Zuckerberg who decide that he's closing Instagram and Don, go over. What are we gonna do with all those stories that you know have been told through those platforms like Facebook? And it has happened actually with Venezuela. Um, YouTube actually eliminated one channel because they were saying things that they shouldn't. And they eliminated, and actually I'm not in agreement with, this, with some of the ideas of this channel, but, but they eliminated the history of that channel for 10 years, hmm. wiped out. Mm -hmm. wiped out. So um, I, I don't want to sound like I'm digressing, but part of, I think, you know, empowering ourselves and building freedom, it's also trying to own uh, those, I mean, like platforms and having control of the platforms where these stories are being hosted. Like it's very difficult to talk about our future without considering the power of media and the power of, you know, all this new explosion of, uh, you know, uh, social media, which has become almost like a parallel reality, right? Um, and uh, so I think that that's really important that we recognize that all these narratives need to be owned by us and we need to find mechanisms of keeping them recording them and and archiving them and hmm. deciding what are we going to do with them so that's my opinion in terms of like media and images and all of that stay with us as long as you can uh Pimmy, jump in what, what are your thoughts no yeah i can i completely agree with esther's point around the need for us to reclaim narratives right and and recognizing that a lot of the work that we need to do it, it's about really addressing these systems of oppression rather than oppressive experiences and i think that um for, for the work that I, that i do in education it's recognizing really two things the first is that history is told by the victors right we we know that and so but victory is claimed by the destined and if we want to be able to own what our future looks like, then we have to tell our stories. And, and Esther, as I, as I heard you talking, I think the most important thing around what you talked about when it came to your filming was that people asked you to bring in other perspectives as though the perspectives that you had were not expert ex perspectives. Exactly. And in fact, they are. And I think, and I think that it is, it is really important for us to recognize that you do not need, you can, or let me say this, let me, let me, let me say this differently. You can, hold expertise, you can hold knowledge based off of the experience of marginalized people and you do not need that to be affirmed by your by, by oppressors. Like that's not necessary in order for us to make meaningful change. And, and I think that when I think about the work of education and I think about doing systems approaches because education is one big system. And if we recognize that systems are designed to do what they do and our systems are creating disparate impacts for black and brown and low income students, then we should take a systems approach to fixing it rather than trying to beef up the students to be able to navigate that system, right? And so, and so I think that we have a lot of work to do in regards to um, creating justice from the inside out, right? Which is the hard part because to Esther's point, you have to get one of these platforms before you can make a real big change, right? And so you do have to work within these structures 
But when you get to the top of these organizations and these structures and these foundations and these boards and these governments, um, remembering who got you there is, is important. And the greater calling for the greater good of society must be what drives you in those moments. Because what, what I've recognized is that um, in a lot of these, these seats of administration, there are so many fires coming at you from so many different directions that it's easy to get um, caught up in the daily headwinds versus staying steady and firm on why you got there in the first place. And I think that we need to, we need to recognize that and really do our best to address these systems rather than these individuals who are victims or perpetuating these systems. And so the reason I talked about uh, Coltrane's music, his song called Both Directions at the Same Time, speaks exactly to what I think both of you are talking about. And that is, number one, as you just said, Femi, uh, making sure that we are at the table everywhere they are, we have to be. Yeah. And we have to be there with an intentionality. And the intentionality is both inserting and projecting and advancing our interest as we see them, as we define them in that environment. But I think at the same time, we have to be working outside and uh, with intent, creating alternative strategies and systems. And that speaks to what you were saying, I believe, Esther, about uh, ownership, about equity. And I think it, it adds up to also <clears throat> coming up with systems of collaboration working with each other in ways that we have not been in the past, uh, in ways we couldn't in the past, but technology is affording us the chance to, you know, you be in Berkeley and Brenda's in uh, uh, New Mexico, I'm in Minnesota, Esther, you're in New York, you could be in Caracas uh, or anywhere, but now we can do deals with each other, do business with each other, collaborate, validate our own selves by ourselves and in ways that we feel uh, represent our, our sensibility of uh, our own personal and therefore our collective sovereignty. Um, can I add one? Can I add one? Go ahead, one? jump in. Absolutely. The only point that I want to add to that is I think that I think that we also need to be committed to allyship in meaningful ways, especially across marginalized communities. There has not been a single movement in this country. Um, that has happened without the work of allyship. And I think that right now, um, there is so much assumed allyship across non-white or non-dominant groups that it's not okay. And I think that we need to figure out how to educate each other on how to best support each other and on the experiences that we are, that we are all going through. Because while, while oppression is a big umbrella, it does create very different experiences for the different groups that are, that are going through that and internalizing that. And so I, I think the importance of, of making sure that we do have allies um, at the table, because it's about the message, not the medium, right? It's, it's about how do we, how do we move, move this, this justice work or this belonging work or this equity work forward, regardless of who is telling that story. Um, I would like to be in a position where I can speak, uh, never on behalf of, but um, to inform people of the experiences of others. Um, and and, and it's, it's really important that we are arming folks with the truth to be able to do that um, on our behalf as well. And and I just want to mm -hmm. um, chip in it regarding Real Sisters. And mm -hmm. I think actually one of the things that I admire about this festival is that's very community-based. The idea is not only um, get together filmmakers from all over the world. We have this year, we have films from Yemen, from New Zealand, from Brazil, um, and uh, and it's wonderful that they're all together you know welcome in these in this platform uh, but also it it's 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 a festival not about awards but about bringing those stories to the community yeah. and it's great to see um how they show the, they be, bring these films from different stories from across you know from uh, different part different uh, ex for example, different black experiences from different parts of the world, um, and uh, and just being shown in a small theater in Harlem, where the community there can come and often talk to the directors and hear from them. Mm -hmm. um, so it's also about these uh, traditionally elitesque, um, uh, you know. A, a, trades or activities or you know in in this case films and bringing it also i mean making it a tool of communication with you know 
uh, with the community. And uh, and a lot of the films are about that, which is great. It's so different to see the films from a different festival and see the films that are submitted to this festival. So many of these films are about representing the community, giving a voice to the community and talking to the community. So that's I, I wanted to add. Well, that's that's wonderful. Brenda, jump in if you have comments or thoughts or questions. I have many, of course, uh, never a shortage uh, for me. Uh, as you're forming your thought or, or question or comment, Brenda. I've written down some, but you go what, ahead. What, you can go, go right ahead. Go right ahead. Well, I just wanted to tell the chancellor that um, I'm kind of a fan of Gavin Newsom. And um, it, my daughters live in L.A., not not the kid. But um, he education is his priority. Mm -hmm. And I think. Everything that I have heard you say as someone who had four decades as an educator, uh, that needs to be in an op-ed. We need to start putting it out there, not because I was given the honor and privilege of writing for Insight, but I heard Dr. Irma McLaurin always said, we've got to tell these stories and people have to listen. And they listen by you know, uh, Al and I came from a good stock of teachers and parents. And education was number one, uno, God, education. So um, one of my my questions, and I'll let my boss come in, what, what are universities doing to change the landscape of training for educators going into classrooms and also the introduction of different careers that our kids are now open for. We've, you know, it's like we had a zest for learning. Yeah. We couldn't read enough. And that's because we didn't have a library. So it became a rarity. But, you know, I, I, I'm just really into seeing the direction that the universities are going to look at the fact that we're no longer in the 18, 19, 20s. Mm -hmm. We have to change our training and we need to give that passion. Our teachers cared about themselves. They cared about us. They cared about our history, our future, everything. I don't see that that much anymore. And we can't blame COVID and racial upheaval. Home, the, 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 all of the systems you talked about. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm really curious about that. Um, I, I'll let Al come in. <laughs> no, uh, go take it, uh, take it to Brother Femi. Go ahead and respond. It's a, it's a, it's a fantastic question. And I think it is one that, I don't think that we look at education as a massive system the way that we need to now. I think, and I think that the ground has shifted um, in ways that I don't think many of us have either been paying attention to when it comes to education. Um, and I'll give you just two quick pieces. The first is recognizing that when you take a look at the WICHI data, the Western Institute Commission of Higher Education, they come out with this data every year that talks around um, the graduation rates and, uh, uh, around the graduation rates for high school students and 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 what that looks like across the country, um, we're seeing significant diversification um, around that. We've been seeing that for for years now, right? We're also seeing uh, a tremendous number of first generation and low income students that are participating um, in in higher education in education generally, and they are moving uh, more towards graduation in ways that they hadn't before. I think the question then begs. Um, to me, there, there are two questions that need to be answered. Um, the first is, how are we preparing teachers for this new um, wave of students? And, and, and recognizing that the, the teachers no longer um, reflect, the, the diversity of teachers do not reflect the diversity of the students in which they're teaching. Now, we can address that from one of two ways. We can either figure out ways to get more student, teachers of color in the pipeline, which I definitely think we need to, but it also means that we need to figure out how do you create cultural competence amongst all of these teachers who are committed to working with students, um, but perhaps might be working with students from backgrounds that they've never experienced before themselves, right? So we, we need to figure that out. 
on a university level, I think that we need to start taking a look at what our first year curriculums look like. And we, yeah, have to start, so. we have to start asking ourselves, especially as public schools, right? If students are graduating um, with K through 12 experiences and they are really strong or top of their class and they're coming onto our campuses and they're not doing well in the first year curriculums, again, that to me is not a call out on the strength of the quality of the student as much more as it begs the question, what does the handoff from K through 12 to higher ed actually look like? And how are we making sure that those two things are aligned? Um, I, I, as, as Al mentioned in my, in my introduction, I'm a, I'm a part of a doctoral program here at Berkeley for leaders in equity and democracy. And one of the things that we're constantly talking about is the difference between high school graduation requirements and college admissions requirements. And why are those so different and so off? If we recognize that in this day and age that the bachelor's degree is the high school degree of the past. And then I think the last thing that I would say, and I, and I, and I don't think I could be a part of this league this lead program that I'm at um, at UC Berkeley without calling this out, is that we don't pay teachers enough. This country does not pay high school teachers or middle school teachers enough. Um, they're not paying the administrators um, enough. And I think that there's been a loss in the basic fundamental understanding that an educated society is for the benefit of all and not just for some. And I think that that has eroded education in a way um, that is just not helpful to the overall mission of what education is supposed to be about. And so, so Brenda, I think that there's a lot there um, that we need to unpack, but notice that what I'm not saying is that we need to have our students do more studying or we need to, like, it, it's, not, it's not that at all, right? Um, we just need to take a look at the ecosystem that they're navigating and decide whether or not the outcomes that we are seeing, especially the, the disparate outcomes, are worth doing something about. My argument to that is absolutely, um, but I also recognize that going back to the allyship piece, I cannot do that alone. No institution can do that alone. Um, and so we, we have to figure out our communities of practice that can actually make significant change. I just want to thank you. I mean, uh, my boss calls it a mic drop. I don't think he's ready to drop the mic yet, but boy, I, I loved everything you said and I am definitely going to be writing that. I appreciate that was perfect. That was exactly what I wanted to hear. I'm like Clarence Jones. That's exactly what I wanted to hear, Al. Thank well, you. Well, great. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. <laughs> we're, about, we're about out of time. Thank you, too. You know, I want to thank uh, Esther Duran. She had to leave earlier, but uh, I want to direct you to realsister.org or go online, Google uh, wow. the... Uh, Film Festival, I have up, you can't see it, a number of the thumbnails for the programs they're doing right now. But go online and join, enjoy that film festival uh, as we speak. Brother Femi Ogundeli, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for uh, hanging out with us and for connecting. I, I didn't get to the question I posed that I come back to. It means we got to do this again. Because I really want to talk about Nigeria, about being first generation, and uh, how we connect with our people. Uh, in the diaspora. So will you come back and talk to me? Absolutely. I absolutely will. And again, Brenda and Al, thank you so much um, for having thank me. You. And, and I, I, I walk away really recognizing um, the words of Maria Kaba that says hope is a discipline. And so while, while we're in the middle of this fight, I recognize that um, we have to make sure that we are mustering at, uh, as much hope and we are beacons of hope in this work. Um, and so, so I appreciate the light that you both shine on our communities, and, and I really appreciate the time to be here with you both. Vote. Thank you, Thank you so much. We have one week. <laughs> Vote. <laughs> I'm Al McFarland. This is The Conversation. We'll see you next time. Take care.